So my topic today is on the luminous path to soul purpose. And if you're in this room, you are on that path. And what I want to share about this is, well, I'm going to read something from a book. <laughs> it's about this very topic. Um, I don't know. That book. I don't know. <laughs> so, you were born with a soul purpose, a reason for being here that spoke deeply to your soul. And your higher self knew that by following this path to soul purpose and fulfilling it, it would teach you every lesson that you need to learn, and it would connect you with all the souls that you need to connect with in this lifetime. Your soul purpose is the foundation for a life worth living, the key to your personal fulfillment, and the secret sauce that gives every moment an extra flavor of joy. Your sole purpose is not a job or a career, although those could be expressions of it. Your sole purpose is not a goal or an intention, though it may be served by those. Your sole purpose is the highest expression of your soul. That's what you are here to be and do. As a soul, you came here for personal reasons, uh, to learn profound lessons, to clear karmic debts, to play, to create, to love to enjoy the incredible privilege of being alive in a body. And you're also here for a larger purpose, which is really part of the calling of our times, which is to awaken and heal humanity, starting with ourselves, <laughs> and, to, to, uh, and to help the planet. So we're, we're here for the very large purpose. We each have our own unique puzzle piece that helps that, that larger calling of this time. And you carry a vital piece of that. And in order to fulfill that, you have to do your own work to awaken and to heal yourself, because otherwise, you're not much able to help anybody else. But if you're in this room, I would say you're also at work on that. So um, basically, the soul, your soul purpose is not an extra, something maybe you get to after you've done everything else in life. It's something that actually calls you forth to be your best self. And most of us don't know what our soul purpose are. Some of us do, this room probably do, but many of us don't know for a good reason, actually, because our subconscious mind is really scared that if you knew your soul purpose, you might get in trouble, like you would maybe then lose some important relationship or lose your job, or you would just be, think you're too big for your riches or whatever your soul, your ego thinks. Like your ego is scared of you actually living your soul purpose. But within you, there is a calling and a an, an, an urge to be the best you can be, to, to grow, to develop, to, to lean into all that you could be. And no matter, no matter what life goes at us, we're just called to do that. So, and it unfolds over time. And this inner calling, following this inner nudge to, to be the best you can be, is what I call following the luminous path. And I call it the luminous path because it lights up before you as you take a step forward new opportunities and, and resources and people come into your life say, here, let me help you. And if you just stay where you are and not moving, then it doesn't move either. Like it, it ha you step into your path by taking action when you're inspired to take action. If you don't ever take action, you will stay in the same place, but, and that's, that's pretty intolerable to us. It feels kind of like dying to not step forward. So um, there's basically five phases on the luminous path. I just want you to listen to these and see, well, where am I? And these are not like a linear thing, like from here to there. These are really more of a spiral because we, we, they keep coming back in our lives. And we're like, and we may feel like, oh no, here I am again. <laughs> but that's not a bad thing. It's just there's more to learn, more to grow. So we, we, it's not even a circle this way. It's a, it's a growth, an upward spiral. And sometimes it can feel like very slow growth. And sometimes we feel like we're zooming along for a while and then we're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, and then farther on. Can, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, I just want you to know there's definitely an upward path that we're all on. So the first phase in, this, in the luminous path is when you haven't really stepped on it, you're like, like it's over there and you're afraid to step onto it, and that's the sleepwalker phase. Mm -hmm. And the sleepwalker phase is basically where you believe that you are a victim, and you truly believe that circumstances, other people are preventing you from doing and being what you want to do and be and have in your life. You may say things like, why does this always happen to me? And so-and-so mm -hmm. won't let me. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, so-and-so's fault that this happened to me. Or, you know, if, if only that hadn't happened, then I could be who I want to be. Those kind of things. And the other side of the, of the victim is the oppressor. Because every oppressor feels like a victim. They feel mm -hmm. totally justified in oppressing because they feel like they are being victimized. And it's sometimes hard to remember why someone's being a total jerk 
or why people are doing terrible things. They always do it because they justify it by feeling victimized, which seems very bizarre that you would do terrible things. But you only do that because you feel like you're being hurt and you're not being treated fairly and you're being wounded. So the, the sleepwalker phase is all about blame and shame, blaming others for what happens to us and blaming life for what happens to us and feeling ashamed that we're not good enough and that we don't feel like we have any control and we try to exert control over others if we, if we lean that way to, by being an oppressor or turn it inward and, and feel ashamed ourselves. So the opportunity of the sleepwalker phase is to give up blame and shame. And when you do that, you really do step onto your luminous path and you start moving toward purpose and to growing and being all you're here to be. As long as you believe you're a victim, you don't have any chance of growing and learning. But you have no responsibility. It's their fault that you're a victim. So that's where the path starts if you realize it's my life to live. There's no one to blame for what happens to me. It's up to me to make it what I can. So then the next phase, which really is the, the, the first really beginning of the luminous path, is what I call the initiate phase. So the initiate phase is where things start cracking open for you. The, the, the things you believed were true about yourself and about life and about society, what's expected of you, is, for various reasons, are, you start to question them. And in this phase, it's often very uncomfortable because you're stepping outside of the paradigm that you have known all your life or you've been living by. And it may be, you may be stepping out of it with curiosity and excitement and sort of growing, or you may be facing it and be totally resisting, which means you'll feel scared, maybe even terrified, stuck, challenged, like really not want to be in this place. But life doesn't care, because life, life wants you to grow, and life is going to give you challenges which force you to question the way you've been living, and to question who you, what you thought was possible. It's going to force you to grow. So, come on in. Oh my gosh, you're here. So good to see you. Come on in. <laughs> um, so in the initiate phase, uh, the, you're, you're, the, it sounds it sounds like a lot of times. Oh, and Ellie came too. It's like old home phase. This is great. <laughs> so in the initiate phase, we're talking about um, the, the luminous path to following your soul purpose. So in the initiate phase, we often wonder, like, what is happening to me? And what does this mean, this, this thing that happened? And, and how can this be? Or who am I? We really start questioning profoundly what is going on with us and with the life. And the, the opportunity of the initiate phase is to awaken, to actually open up to a higher level of awareness. And awakening means if you actually allow your paradigm to crack open, you allow your view of yourself, which is fairly limited, to crack open, you discover a new and larger reality. But we're often terrified of that. You don't want to have crack our paradigm open at all. And I'm going to tell you a story about this later. I just want to quickly go through the phases. So the third phase in the luminous path is the truth teller phase. So in the truth teller phase, your perception is, is that there's, you, you, there's a truth that needs to be spoken. And either you're going to tell the truth and say it, or you're going to lie or not say it. Because in every one of these phases, you have a choice to do the thing that takes courage and that's true to you, or the thing that is um, that is not courageous and where it keeps you stuck. So there's always that choice every space of the way. It's, there's always stepping forward or staying where you are, which means moving backwards. And we have that choice really every moment. Are we going to do the higher thing? Are we going to do the more fearful thing? And there's no judgment, really. It's just to notice, like, all the time we are being asked, which are you choosing? So in the truth teller phase, um, the feeling of it is you either are in power, but you're speaking up, you're saying things you've never said before, you're telling that person the thing you needed to do, you're asking for the raise, you're, you know, you're speaking up, or you're disempowered and you're not speaking up, and you feel like you're not heard and not seen, and it's, it's really pretty painful and uncomfortable. And the thoughts in the truth teller phase are things like, who do you think you are? You might be telling to yourself, like, how dare you think you're all that? And, you know, how dare you say, speak truth to power? Or you might believe no one will listen. You might believe that if I speak, I'll get in trouble. I'll be mocked, or maybe I'll even be in danger. Like sometimes activists, um, just did, like many times people who are activists feel called to tell the truth about something important. And it takes a lot of courage because they're aware they will be the targets of judgment and maybe punishment, arrest, whatever. So the, the truth teller phase is an important phase that gives us the opportunity. The opportunity of the truth teller phase is to become a leader. When you speak your truth, you give other people courage to speak their truth, too. And when you stand up for what matters to you, that 
is so powerful that it spreads that courage to everybody around you, it inspires others to do the same. Because courage and authenticity are inspiring and contagious. That's how revolutions start. <laughs> so two more phases. Um, and these are each ascending levels of awareness of consciousness. So the agent is the next one. And the agent is where instead of feeling like a victim, you are very clear that you are the one who creates your reality. You're, you know that you feel like you have a sense of control, you have a sense of um, independence and agency. And either you're confidently taking action where you haven't before, where you've been stopped, or you're procrastinating and not taking action due to self-doubt or um, fear, lack of clarity. So the agent phase is really kind of like, I can make it happen, you know, I'm empowered to do something about it. Or I'll sh even might sound like more like, I'll show them, you know, they can't hold me back. <laughs> or it might be feeling the opposite, like you feel like you're afraid to take action, like there's too much to do, you're overwhelmed, or you're not sure what to do, or it's a lot harder than you thought it would be when you started out. Or you might be really terrified of success or failure. That failure is more what we think of, but people are often terrified of success too, because then you'll be at some other level and maybe you'll lose your friends, maybe you won't be standing on anything solid. Hmm. So, um, so the opportunity of the agent phase, ironically enough, is to surrender. Instead of all the doing and things you have, think you have to do in the agent phase, is to surrender. Because if you give up control to a higher power, things work a lot better than if you try to do, think it's all up to you to do it. So when you surrender, you can receive inner guidance for clarity and for direction and support. And then you start taking action from inspiration, not should. It's like, I should fix that. I should, try to, I should tell them what to do and try to make them do what I want them to do. All that place of control that the agent phase is all about, in the end, becomes too limiting. So for the, for the sleepwalker, actually being an agent is a huge leap to actually go from being a victim to, I can do something about this. But if you just stay, it's all up to me to do it. You lose the opportunity to really get the higher power to come through you and do what needs to happen. And then the last phase is the vessel phase. And the vessel phase is that experience of surrender. When we actually, as Jerry was talking about, um, ask ourselves, let the divine do what it needs to do through us. In other words, we, we are in a state of uh, not trying to do it all ourselves and not thinking that we, are, that we create the miracles and magic in our lives. We, we acknowledge the source of that and we let that source use us. And the feeling of that is being receptive and guided and allowing, being a service and a flow, love and joy. We might think things like, thy will, not my will. I remember for a long time that was my prayer. Thy will, not my will, because I had a very strong will. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's not I, but God who does the work, et cetera, deep joy. Mm. And, um, and for this phase, too, there is an opportunity beyond that phase, which is not just to awaken, but to actually be enlightened, to have a higher level of awareness where you see, not just as an intellectual idea, but you profoundly experience the oneness of everything. You see that every person you see is another child of God, just like you. And no matter how they're behaving, you see and speak to and, and hold them in that divine child self as opposed to what looks like an oppressor or a victim. And in you, when you do this, there is no more suffering. And you may, to actually stay in that stage is challenging. <laughs> but, but that opportunity is again and again to come back to it. So that's, that's a general overview. And as you're listening, you may be thinking, oh, I, I recognize myself in one of those phases or another. But it's much more real, I think, when I give you some examples of what it's like. And I don't know how much time I have. Do I have, what kind of time do I have? We close when it's time. Close when it's time. <laughs> there is a man who surrendered. <laughs> as much, yeah, you can, much time as you want. Okay. So I think, I think I'm going to bring this home. I'm going to give some examples from my life. And I, I'm going to invite you, if you feel brave enough to do this, to perhaps share an example from your life if you feel called to do that. For, and I'm going to particularly focus on the initiate phase because that is probably the most challenging a lot of times for us because... Well, for one thing, it shows up as a challenge, usually, to crack open our understandings. And it mm. can be a traumatic initiation, like, you know, something terrible happens, or it can be a more gentle kind of questioning um, initiation, which just sort of makes us start thinking, huh. Not very likely. What's that? I said, not very likely. <laughs> well, those do happen sometimes. So I'll give you an example. The very first initiation that I'm aware of having as an adult, I, mean, I had some as a child, but then, like, a lot of people... When we were children and, and, and teenagers, we had a pretty good understanding of what lit us up and what our pathway might be. 
But for most of us, that wasn't supported by our environment. Other people didn't say, you go. They, uh, they, they actively squashed it or just ignored it or didn't support it. So mm -hmm. we didn't really step into that path as, um, after those early years. So for, that happened to me. So at age 44, this is my first initiation. It's a very gentle initiation. <laughs> it was my birthday. And I, I had this new friend who made me this birthday card. And in the card, she acknowledged the essence of who I am. And I was like, I was deeply touched by this, but I was also astounded. Like, how does she know this about me? I didn't even know this about me. But when she <laughs> reflected it back to me, I was like, that, that is who I am. I was kind of like, wow. And what was really an initiation about this is, we just met. She could see that in me, but I didn't see it in myself. And I was like, I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to speak truth like that. I want to learn how to see past this confusion that I have in here to see what's real about myself and other people. And that lit this flame of longing within me to learn and to grow and to develop. And, and it cracked open who I thought I was. I, I hadn't even been aware there was like a deeper level of who I was, which mm -hmm. I pressed down for a long time. So that started me on the luminous path, that questioning, mm -hmm. that desire to learn and grow. Before that, I always say, my life is great, everything is happy, everything's fine. Even when it wasn't, because I wouldn't let myself see what wasn't fine, because I was very attached to looking good. <laughs> Some of you might be able to relate. So the early, the early um, initiate phase is where we start questioning received wisdom about who we are and who we can be, and we start noticing that we've been conditioned by our families, by our culture, by our society, to behave and to be in, in certain ways. And we start going like, wait a minute, do I really have to do this and be this? Maybe I don't have to be. And ultimately, the initiate phase, that's the beginning kind of gentle version, <laughs> unless you have a traumatic initiation. Ultimately, though, it's going to crack open your whole reality. Because mm. the, ulti the ultimate um, goal of the initiate phase is literally to illuminate your consciousness. Mm. To illuminate your consciousness. And in traditional societies, people would go through formal rites of initiation. And, and also in mystic orders and all kinds of uh, spiritual traditions, people go through initiate um, uh, experiences. They have a pathway they follow. But in modern Western culture, we've forgotten all about that. We don't have that. And yet there are no shortage of people going through initiations because life, God, the divine, wants to initiate us. And we can't mm -hmm. escape. <laughs> so even if we don't formally have them, we experience them. And they could be, they can get increasingly, uh, uh, if you don't listen, <laughs> they can get more and more mm. intense. I'm just going to share a little mm. story from that too. So I, I've, I've been through so many initiation phases. Uh, and I don't, is anybody else here, when, you, when I say initiate phase, initiation phase, do you have an awareness that you've gone through one or you may be in one? <laughs> so, is there anything, can you relate to that? I just want to check and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's powerful to have a name for it, because we often think something's wrong with me, or what is going on with me, like why can't I fit in, why can't I be happy, why can't I, whatever. Uh, but it's really a phase of um, your spiritual path. And if you don't listen, like they keep coming around again, like <laughs> you have more, come on, come on, you know, crack open more. If you don't listen, um, it can get pretty intense. So. <laughs> um, Years after mm. that first gentle initiation, I did a lot of growing and developing and, and stretching and going into other phases after that. But then I came around again, another initiation. And this one was, um, I had decided to do something my mentors did. I decided to lead a retreat on the other side of the country. It was going to be like this big three-day event. I was going to have like lots of people there. We were going to do this whole process. There would be speakers from the stage, this whole big thing, which... I was in no way ready in my business to do, <laughs> but I decided to do that. I reserved this big retreat center, and then there's the reality of having people come there, and I realized pretty soon, like, you know what, I'm not, I live here. I don't know that many people on the West Coast. There's no way I'm going to get a lot of people there. And before long, I realized I'm not going to be able to fulfill the contract, the rental agreement. I hadn't even realized I was on the hook for that amount of money. Like I said, I'm going to have you know 40 people there for, for the for the three days, or maybe it was even five days, and the, all their meals, rooms, reservations. I didn't realize I was posting on the hook for that. I was mm. that ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> didn't read contracts. I learned a lot of things. And so what ended up happening is I ended up, um, and, they, and they wouldn't negotiate. They wouldn't lower the contracts. So I was on the hook for like $22,000. Mm. I was not expected to be on the hook for i have never done a debt before. I was... I felt like I was going to die. Like I, I, I just thought, what am I going to do? I, I have no way to pay this. My life is over. 
whatever. So the whole period, getting closer and closer to the retreat, I was just feeling like, I, you know, so resistant and so angry, like, this shouldn't be. I was feeling like a victim, like, that, you know, I shouldn't have signed that contract, whatever, all these mm. things. I got there, and I decided, instead of doing the thing I'd planned to do, what we were going to do instead was something that was completely guided. We were just going to follow inner guidance every day and do what needed, whatever arose, and with the intention that we would each have a, a miraculous breakthrough. Pretty big promise. <laughs> But we did, we did inside that intention. And it was an incredibly powerful experience of, of profound surrender, really, because I didn't know what else to do except surrender. <laughs> um, so that, so that, that initiation, I gave into that, and, and it turned out there was a way eventually to pay all that off. But the more we, and then I came back home, and um, I realized afterwards, I, I met my soulmate um, the same year, and I realized that I thought he was going to move up to Ithaca, where I lived, and we would have life happily ever after, but he's a therapist down here in this area, and it made no sense for him to move to Ithaca on his practice down here every day. So I realized I'm going to have to move, and I'd lived in Ithaca for decades, I was deeply immersed in the community, um, and I did not want to go. <laughs> mm. Not at all. <clears throat> and in fact, I so little wanted to go, this is the last story I'll tell, I'll check with you guys. It's the day before I have to move. And I haven't started packing at all. <laughs> so I've got a bunch of boxes. <laughs> Nothing has happened at all. And I am just like crying and feeling very sorry for myself that I have to leave my beautiful place and go down to Binghamton. <laughs> 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 and, and there's this knock at the door. I go up to the door, and there's these two young men with white shirts and black ties and clean pressed pants. They're like, hello. And I said, hello, like, what are you selling? And they say, we're on, a, we're Mormon missionaries, and we need to uh, do service missions. Is there anything mm. we can do to help you? Oh, like, wow. Nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and they asked three times, like in a fairy tale, are you sure? <laughs> we can't do something. Maybe clean your yard or something. We're on a service mission. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I set them off. I took their little brochure, and I sat down with my boxes. Oh, my God, I've got to start packing. <laughs> And I thought eventually, I should ask somebody to help me. Maybe I could ask, and it still was so clueless. I, I thought I'd call my daughter. So my younger daughter came over to help me pack. And we're in the kitchen, and we're packing the boxes. There's these big, high cabinets. And I reach up to get something, and I hit the top of my head in the corner of the cabinet. Mm. Oh my god, that hurt so much. I, I like actually fell down on the floor, like, ow, 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 ow. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I wonder what it means when you hit the top of your head. Like, that's not easy to do, right? It's like crown chakra. I was like, oh. It's like... Open up, we're, we're trying to help you. <laughs> and I, just, I was like, oh, I don't know about that. And then that night was like the, the, the ultimate version of this. So it was Halloween night. And at the time, that was a really big deal. We, our house got hundreds, 500, 600 kids trick or treating. Oh, my goodness. Out. So I was, um, I was there. My sweetheart was there. We were at my former husband's house at the time because we, we were now separating, but we were all good friends. And there's all these trick-or-treaters coming, and toward the end of the night, there's this young girl who's maybe like, I don't know, 12 or 13 comes up. She's wearing this sort of long white robe. She's got all these vines and flowers twisted all around <laughs> her, and a big sign on her says, Life. And she comes up to the door, and she doesn't say trick-or-treat like kids usually do, or even Happy Halloween. She just holds me this kind of, she's sort of surly. She holds me this, hands me this little yellow piece of paper. And she says, Here. I said, What is it? And I look at it, and she says, and I look at it, and look, it looks like the yellow submarines from it. So I'm guessing, is it a lemon? She's like, duh. And she says, you know what to do with it. And behind me, my sweetheart starts cracking up. She says, oh my God, did life just tell you, hand you a lemonade and say, you know, a lemon and say, you know what to do with it? Like, like I'm not, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and the next day, I did, I did get it packed, and I did move down here crying all the way. But, but, and so I went through a long, long period of resistance. But it's really amazing. Like, life was trying to initiate me, and the, the, ver the view of myself that I thought I had mm. was deeply enmeshed in this one place. Like, I thought home is where Ithaca is. If I'm not in Ithaca, I don't, I don't have home. Like, I really thought I was lost, like floating in, the, in space. And uh, so, but eventually it did lead to good things as, as I'm here. So I could go on telling lots of stories about this, but I wonder if anybody else has a story of initiation, or maybe if you wonder if you're in an experience of initiation. It doesn't have to be as long as mine. <laughs> <laughs> and it can, be, it can be a big challenge. Like a lot of times it'll show up as a big challenge. Yeah, Mary. Well, just sort of an observation uh -huh. that in that 
tearing yourself away from your safety net, your feelings about what home meant to you, yeah. in, and you made the choice to choose love yes. instead of that, even Thank though you. it was very painful, yeah. but the reality was you, that was one step closer to learning how to separate from this world and be of the next one. Because you totally you got that, it. That, that you totally got it. You did. You were much wiser than I was. So <laughs> <laughs> for, for what I realized is that I realized that home is wherever I am. Like communities wherever I am. And I started, once I accepted that, I started realizing, oh, there's people in, in Binghamton I can connect with. I saw there was um, Edmund Cotton's uh, yoga studio, like bringing enlightenment to the southern tier. I was like, oh, there are like minded people here. And I found unity. Oh, more like minded people here. Oh, my goodness. So that's the opportunity exactly. When you let go of the limiting story, you can discover the truer and bigger story, or reality, really. Yeah. Yeah, there. Um. I think one of the ones that comes to mind, when you said the age 44, mm -hmm. that was like a magical age for me. When 44 happened, this major transformation opportunity happened. And I had to take a leap into the unknown. And I had to face what was being mirrored to me. Mm -hmm. And it was telling me, you must now face your fears yeah. and then do so this whole thing opened up for me which was whatever you're afraid of that comes your way it was like a little voice in my head mm -hmm. just do it mm -hmm. no matter what it is even if you think your life is threatened mm -hmm. even if you think you're going to die mm -hmm. just do it wow. don't let anything stop you which is like the message I saw yeah. today on the you're shirt you're still reminding yourself yeah. I'm still reminding myself. Yeah. So that began a whole journey of about 15 years in particular that was so uh, new and challenging, and I had to go through each door. Here's another one. Experience this and just keep going. Mm -hmm. And so I had to face fear so many times yeah. and then trust. And every time I trusted... <coughs> I ended up okay at yeah. some point. What has that given you, continually going through fear and trusting? Uh, just more trust and surrender and uh, more awareness that there is no death. And even though I got close to death a number of times, mm -hmm. that life can continue whether it's here or someplace else. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just expanded like a confidence and a presence and um, connection, just being able to connect with almost anything. So instead of my world being like this small, mm -hmm. my world became huge, like there was no end to it. Yes. It said, said to me, there's no end to the world. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you look at, it'll keep expanding. Mm -hmm. So there are no no ends to it, and life is eternal and continues in many different forms. Yeah. I don't have to be in this form. Mm -hmm. Or whatever I am right now, there will be another form. Yeah. So it was like very magical and uh, powerful. So Yeah, yeah. so you, you, went, you went through a powerful awakening, a series of awakenings to basically the, the vessel phase. Yeah, yeah phase, it was right? great. And what you said about what you, whatever you focus on expands, that also goes for negative things. So whatever you seek, you shall find. If you're focused on what's wrong and how this person is treating you right, blah, 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 you make more of that because you find more and more examples and whatever. So it's so important to notice what we're focusing on. Right, but I also learned that there is no negative or positive mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. of experience. True, it's our labeling of it. It's yeah. just labeling, and basically you can also, I was shown, you can jump into whatever is thought to be negative. Absolutely. So I jumped fully into the negative. I jumped fully into the darkness. I jumped into the fear. And that was a whole world. Mm -hmm. And to be able to then trust that experience too because it's an experience yes. and it's part of who we are yes. Yes. it's you know we're everything yeah. so there's nothing held from us right. so when you say i don't want this or i don't want that then i'm hiding from like half of the experience half of the world yes. 
So just be with it. It's a vibration. It's an experience. And notice you. Because people will also want to have lunch and other things. So thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to say, in my book, we talk about these phases in much more detail, along with tools and community. <laughs> That's for me, me only. You can hold you, help me open with a moment of silence. Meditating on the call, and then we will say the call together. It's heavy. So we find that the copy of the order of service. Yep. There is but one breath and one power in the universe and in my life. God, the good, omnipotent. That statement right there always blows me away. It, I mean, you get disturbed by things, and I, I, at least when I get disturbed, I try to remember the statement. Can we try to say it again? Yeah. There is but one, one presence, presence and one, one power in the universe, universe and in, in my life. God, God the good, the omnipotent. And the other song goes? Yes. How you doing? Down in my soul.
Time for announcements. Uh, announcements that I'm aware of is there will be no service on Labor Day weekend. There won't. Uh, no. Yeah. Not, not for Unity in the Southern Tier, at least. Well, that's August 1st, is it? That would be it's September. Next, it's so seven days. September. Seven days. Seven, no, okay. seven. Next Sunday. This, next Sunday, This yeah. coming up Sunday. Right, but what's the date? I forgot. September. Well, first or second or third? So it would be the second. Maybe the second? So. Uh, first. No well, church. <laughs> <laughs> first. It's first. It's Labor Day. September 1st. Yeah, why not? Or you have to ask the board. I don't, I don't ask know. Reason why because I Labor Day, Memorial Day, they figure there's too many things going on. People are busy. The board, and <laughs> there was discussion Carry about on. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think because whenever there's it's a holiday, nobody display. shows up. <laughs> Oops, I didn't say that. Um, and then I know who the speaker will be on September 8th. That would be me. Jerry speaking, and yeah. And I'll be speaking on uh, the law of being. You know, when the Hebrews were instructed to follow the law, I believe that's the law that they were taught to follow. Yeah. Not necessarily the Ten Commandments. Stay tuned, more to be revealed on the 8th. Oh, sounds oh, good. I always wondered about that. Yeah. I was always wondering about that. The 15th. Anybody get the email? That yes. Comes? I know it's posted on the email. But it's the 15th is... Um, is that Sibby? Kessler, I think. Or Jody. Okay. Jody Kessler. Mm -hmm. And also in a month we're going to have Sibby Morrow come. Oh, Sibby Morrow, yeah, after that. And so. And, and Jamie Waters. And maybe Waters. Jamie. So for the month of September, there's three good speakers and no one. Because we have five Sundays in September. Yeah. So that's why I guess they figured they could eliminate one. Uh, any other <laughs> announcements? There's lots of music in Binghamton today. They have Porch Fest. So go on the, what is it, the west side, even on Davis Street where... Or, you know, some people we know live. Um, all kinds of music, people on porches, all kinds of musicians, and they just people just go from place to place. <laughs> so. yeah, it's one of the community things that makes them unique. Yeah, a nice community I think thing. Have 63 bands or something this year. Oh, something yeah, wild. Some of the outrageous number. Yes. And they have a trolley that will take you around from place to place. Oh, they do? Ooh. If you meet at Rec Park. Oh, that's nice. That's cute. Anything and else? Rec and Rec Park, the, do they still have their carousel going? I, been I think it's still maybe till Labor Day. If anybody yeah. wants to use the free carousels, which I think are wonderful. Yeah. And let like you welcome okay. regular members and new members. And we open our hearts and doors to new individuals and families. We know that the right perfect people are joining us at the right perfect time. I'm not familiar. Would you like to introduce your first name? Oh, yeah. Um, my name is Michelle. My nickname is Shelly, and I was invited here by Dan. Oh, well, glad you're here. You're welcome. Hello. 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 And it is time to greet our, our neighbors. We can do it quickly. We can do it after the service. If you're comfortable with the hug, you're just not going to answer it. I was dreaming. I think I canceled. It was only like one. Oh, 
So maybe if we print up a sign because I'm right on the main street. I like to get people to pre-register so I know how many drums to bring. Well, if you come over, we see the place and see if you think it's a good place to do. Where is it located? It's in Vestal. It's in Vestal right off of 434 on Main Street. Right around the corner. Okay. So we have a sign, John. Thing found during the week, or new past, near past, or something that reminds you of that warm power. You felt that power. <coughs> Anything that reminds you of your connectedness to the universe and the world, and to the higher, beyond the Creator, or anything that reminds you that all you see is not all that there is. <laughs> Does anybody have a unity moment they'd like to share? They're ringing the bell, I guess, the church bell at noon. Is there a special reason they I told me? I believe there is a special reason. I asked Mary what it was. And Did I, she know? Mary, Mary told me it was it's four minutes of peace. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, four it's minutes of peace. Of wars. She, I, she wanted I, if I'm, peace. I'm not a history buff, but I'm thinking that maybe it was the armistice of the Pacific campaign. Yeah, she, she wants to promote peace. Yeah, or maybe it was to drop into the bomb, even. Ringing the bell. Oh. Well, now that I think of it, I hate it. I did hear somebody talking about that it was to drop into the bomb. She said something about four different wars. Oh, okay. I forgot to ask. The right. film's yeah. left right. Well, we could take a moment to at least remember mm. the lives that were lost on both sides, or all sides, and yes. recognize that peace begins within ourselves. So we'll take a moment of peace right now. Mm-hmm. And remember, there is one power, that's God the good. War is something of our world that we created, and we could easily change it just by a change of mind. Bring peace into the world, and we could bring it manifest. Mm -hmm. report to remember that though there were many deaths caused by the war, not one soul was lost. <laughs> all right. <laughs> God has them all under control on all sides. So back to the unity moment. Is there anything like a light bulb or something that a, a light a light bulb, yeah. This morning I went to uh, pick up Carol at a friend's house. And one of the women there, her sister was there, and she had this purple shirt on. And when I looked in the back of the shirt, it said, nothing stops me. So I felt it was like a message from spirit. <coughs> so I took a picture. I said, I have to take a picture of your back. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, nothing stops me. So it's a message if anybody connects with it and myself connected with it. Yeah. You know, so I thought that was interesting. Little messages we get. I recently, we recently went to a family reunion, and my mother and her sister. My mother's 88, her sister's 95, mm. and they have been at odds their whole life. We went to visit my her, my aunt, in the nursing home, and she's lost her memory. So that she basically, <laughs> she was continually saying, "And who are you again?" But she was so curious. And so open in a way that she actually wasn't so much because she had her memory. <laughs> um, and my, so she, what happens, I saw my mother, I could, they were talking together, and my mother's like eyes were sparkling, her face is all rosy, and I was like, she was lit up. And normally they, they've been you know, arguing and, and feeling hurt by each other. So I was just astounded to watch them. And I went closer to hear what they were saying, and my, and my aunt, who's forgotten her memory, just kept... She, she was a therapist for a long time, so she just was in therapist mode. She said, tell me more. She was like listening to my mother in a way my mother wanted her whole life to be listened to uh -huh. by her sister. And that's why she was like lit up and wow. they were holding hands. And, and they were like, they were having the conversation they waited their whole lives to have. And I was so moved to watch this divine experience. It just erased the memory and just pure presence. This love, nothing but love. It was an amazing experience. Beautiful. Yeah, I love this so, story. Yeah. What you're saying nice. basically is any grievance can't 
can be forgotten. Apparently so. <laughs> yeah. Apparently so, which is amazing. You don't have to hold on to them. You, you just need to have a memory wipe. <laughs> so there can I be. I did a lot of that in my days. Oh. <laughs> no, but that's another story. So there can be good things to memory loss. So there can be a good sign. Oh, yeah, it was a beautiful thing. Beautiful. It's not considered I, I the same so thing hard. With my mother, she yeah. had Alzheimer's too. Mm -hmm. There was people that she always did not like, and then suddenly she was open to them. And <laughs> forgot what she was all oh, upset that's about. Lesson <laughs> forgetting. Yeah. yeah. So just the app. That she gets angry when she never used to. <laughs> it oh, wow. Well. Did she take her meds? No. Okay, because my mother did get that way when they started giving her meds. Really? Yeah. Okay. She got angry? People disoriented and, and, yeah. and feel like they're losing control. It's yeah, that, that could cause yeah. internal anger. Yeah. Anger too. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. It's time for the blessing of our prayer request. God's all encompassing, though. Oh, we could read this together. Yeah. For our service. God, God's all encompassing love is doing its perfect work in and in our lives. is established in every area of our lives. And so, so it, is. it is. And Peggy's doing her perfect work through us, too, with a prayer box in the back. If you want to write down your specific prayers, please print it neatly because there's sometimes a communication broke between the written handwriting and the request. So if you take your prayer request, specifically put it in the box, Peggy will pray over it and send it out to Unity, Silent Unity, um, and be summit, and they will pray over it for 30 days, 24-7. It's an amazing service that Unity offers worldwide. It's not mm. just for Unity members, but it's worldwide. If you have a special prayer request, Write it down, put it in the box, and we'll be faithful by special uh, sign of unity. It's time for the daily word. Our daily word we don't have current. I have for August 25th, 2017. If somebody wants to read it. Yeah. If anybody wants to read it. Um, hmm? more That's one thing about the daily word is it's always current. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> They're in the back. They're in the back. Mm -hmm. Ready? I recognize and celebrate my spiritual growth. I am an active participant in life's unfolding. Even the smallest moments are worthy of celebration because I am reflecting God in all that I think, say, and do. As I express reverence and appreciation for what seem like minor triumphs, I empower more of what I want rather than what I do not want. I celebrate my spiritual growth, rejoicing in the times I look. I took the high road in a conflict, the moments I chose love over compulsion to be seen as right. Perhaps I choose to applaud the time I asked for needed help and actually received it. Or I might elect to honor the moment I mustered the courage to speak my truth. I recognize and celebrate my accomplishments and my spiritual growth. You shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given you. Deuteronomy 26, 11. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Meditation. Um, I've said it before. I do not go good at guiding meditation. Do I have a volunteer to guide us in meditation? <laughs> Peggy did volunteer to guide us in meditation. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, close your eyes and... When you breathe in, imagine the ocean wave coming in, and when you breathe out, imagine that going back out. And if any thoughts come in, observe them and let them go. And we'll do this for a couple of minutes. Try and do this every day, you'll start feeling a little less stressed and more calm. When 
when you're ready, slowly open your eyes. Thank you. on your papers, um, this song called Blissful Serenity.
church here is celebrating the rally day on the 8th when we come back after the, the Labor Day weekend. That's the second Sunday of the month where we usually host the mm -hmm. coffee hour. Because of the rally day celebration, 150 years of this building being here, they're going to have their own type of celebration designed for after their service. And they were wondering if us at Unity would sponsor their coffee hour on the third Sunday of the month. 
Mm -hmm. And too, that's a competition, so it may be difficult, but if you can, please try to prepare something where we can share it with them and have it for ourselves later. And Vera, can you remember to put that on the oh, yeah, try newsletter and or whatever you post on So the, we can do both, you mean? Yeah, Coffee we can do hour. both on the third Sunday of the month. What is that? Yeah, the third Sunday third of the month, Sunday. which is the 15th. Third Sunday of the month, right. And now it's time to close. If you care okay to join us, we form a circle. Mm -hmm. Say the little piece on this song. And then follow that with the statement of our uh, faith.